my favorite books in the New Testament. Absolutely, hands down, one of my favorite books in the New Testament. It's the book of Colossians. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at the first four verses of Colossians 3. And the title of my message this morning is, The Battle Between Our Ears. The Battle Between Our Ears. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this time to be in your word. Lord, you know the battlefield of our minds. Lord, you know the, the lies that have been spoken to us, the lies that we think about us, about the world, about you, about Jesus, about everything. You know it all. And so many, Father, are defeated. So many are discouraged and even feel like giving up. And I pray, Father God, that you would use our short time together. Lord, would you please illuminate your word? Help us to understand who you are, what Christ has done, and who we are in Christ. May that be the focal point of what we think about. May it change the way we live. Help us, we pray, win the battle between our ears. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of my brothers and sisters in Christ said, amen, amen and amen. I remember the very first time I ever gave a sermon at Calvary Chapel Worship Center. It was back in the early, mid-90s. That's how long I've been working with Pastor Rich. Since the mid-90s, I had a full head of hair back then, my friends. I had moved from Washington down to Oregon to go to school at Multnomah Biblical Seminary. Was excited because after meeting with Pastor Rich, with the elders, with the leadership, they invited me to come on staff. I was excited about life. And I'm new, I'm on staff, and now it's my very first time to teach God's word to the congregation at Calvary Chapel Worship Center. But we weren't meeting here. We were renting out to Walleton Valley Junior Academy, which is on baseline, if you remember where that's at, Tualatin Valley Junior Academy. We rented out the entire school, and we took the gymnasium and put chairs in there, we put dividers in there, we put sound equipment in there, and Pastor Rich called it a sanctuasium. Now, does that sound like Pastor Rich or what? A sanctuasium. Now, back in the day, we only had one car, and so I would leave the car at home with my wife and our kids, and Pastor Rich would pick me up in the morning, and before we went to the church to get the church ready, the sanctuasium ready, we would go have breakfast at McDonald's together. We would, yes, yes. And, and so we're having breakfast with one of the members of the worship team who played bass guitar and ran sound all at the same time. Now that's talent. He's playing bass and running sound. That tells you how small the church was at the time. So we're having breakfast, and I'll never forget this conversation. It's right before I'm supposed to teach, mind you. And so Pastor Rich says to this man, he says, how are things going? He says, Pastor Rich, they're not going very good. Well, well why? Uh, do you know the problems that are going on in the church right now? Rich goes, no. Well, there are a lot of people who are very unhappy in the church right now. And Pastor Rich goes, well, why? And I'll never forget. I haven't even had a chance to digest my Egg McMuffin yet. And the man points his finger right at me. And he says, people are upset that you hired him because they think you should have hired someone else who's in the church. Now, you can imagine the battle between my ears right at then. I've got to talk to these people. I've got to teach God's word for the very first time, and I don't know who likes me or hates me. Should I eat some worms? I don't know what to do. My mind is just going around and around in circles. And so we're driving from McDonald's after breakfast to TVJA, and Pastor Rich is just trying to build me up. It's going to be okay, Matt. It's going to be okay. I believe in you. I know God's called you for such a time as this. I want you to step into this. I want you to give the message, win their hearts over. And I'm thinking, yeah, but they really don't like me. 
there's a battle going on between my ears. Well, worship was completed. The mess, the uh, the the uh, the uh, announcements were given, and now it's my turn to stand up and give the message. And I am looking out over the crowd like I'm looking at you guys right now, and I'm wondering who likes me and who hates me. But I will never forget this. My pastor, matter of fact, it makes me emotional just thinking about it, touches my heart. He stood right in the back, back over there at the very back row, and he's listening to me teach. He's listening to me give my introduction. And I'll never forget about halfway through my introduction, this is what Pastor Rich did. He goes like this. <laughs> in my sermon. No one else could see it, but I could see it. Can I tell you what that did to my heart? All of a sudden I realized my pastor, he's got my back. They may hate me now, but he believes in me. And we've been working together ever since. How cool is that? I'll never forget that moment. That regardless of what others may be thinking about me, he believed in me. He's standing with me. He's doing that and cheering me on. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if Pastor Rich could follow us around and cheer us up and give us wise counsel whenever we face difficulties? I mean, all of us would admit Pastor Rich is a wonderful pastor, and we're blessed to have him as our pastor. But you and I both know, and he would quickly admit, the truth is he's not able to follow us all around 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to build us up, to go like this whenever we feel discouraged. But we do have an all-present, all-knowing, all-powerful, wonderful counselor and savior Jesus Christ, who is with us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we also have God's word, the Holy Bible, because God wants us to have his perspective and wise counsel to guide us when we face temptations or trials. And during our study this morning, we're going to discover some of the divine principles from Colossians 3 to help us be victorious over a very real and ever-present battle. It's the battle between our ears. And it's my prayer that as we look at a lot of deep theology, because it's going to be a lot of deep theology, that it will illuminate your understanding to such a degree that it changes the way you live. When we understand who God is, when we understand what Jesus has done, when we understand who we are in Christ and the victory that is already ours, just waiting for us to take hold of, my friends, we can win the battle between our ears because Christ has already given us the victory. Let's begin in verse 1 of Colossians 3. Therefore, Paul says, if, which I believe should be translated more strongly as since. Therefore, since you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Context is so important. And when Paul pens this letter to the Christians in Colossae, he's in a prison cell. Now, Paul had never met the saints in Colossae, but he had gotten word that they were under attack, and so he's concerned about their welfare. He had heard that they're under attack because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to stop right there. Before we go any further in our study, I want us to digest that context. I want it to marinate in our minds. I want us to understand what this means. Think about this. We need to put ourselves in Paul's sandals. We need to ask ourselves, why would Paul be concerned about strangers when he's sitting in a prison cell for his faith? Think about that. Imagine the battle between his ears. 
what it must have been like as he sat in that cold prison cell. Imagine how easy it must have been for Paul to get discouraged, to grumble, to complain, or even to give up, to say to himself, they think they have problems in Colossae? Try prison on for size. How was Paul able to rise up above his unjust confinement and pen a letter which not only encouraged the struggling saints in Colossae, but also the saints in every century since? See, I'm convinced, and this is where it becomes so important for us to understand, a right theology a right understanding of who God is and what Christ has done for us and who we are in Christ can change the way we see life and live life. It was true for Paul. I'm convinced that the words that he writes here in Colossians 3 were the result of his personal victory over the battle between his ears. So this means that Paul is sharing principles that he discovered as he's maturing in his faith, principles that he discovered while he's suffering for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lessons learned, victories won, while in the war-torn trenches of spiritual warfare, the battle between his ears. Oh, there's a lot of theology that we're going to look at, and I find it interesting. If you look at Colossians 3, you have so much theology packed in the first four verses, and he uses that before he gets into things like, don't be angry, put on love. Don't lust, put on purity. Don't lie, walk in the truth. You see, if we have a right understanding of who God is, what Christ has done for us and who we are in Christ, it can change the way we live. We can win the battle between our ears. This passage here, and what we have in Paul's example, I believe are the keys to winning the battle between our ears. And the first key for winning the battle between our ears is this. It's found in verse 1. Keep seeking the things above. Keep seeking the things above. Let me explain what I mean. Our world is filled with many wonderful, beautiful things. But I'm sure you would agree with me that it is also filled with many vile things which can lure us away from God and into the shadows of sin. Today, you don't have to scratch too hard or dig too deep to find vile, soul-destroying filth. The truth is, if you're looking for trouble... You won't have any problem trying to find it because it's often one click away. And oh, by the way, perhaps you've heard social media platforms are tracking you too. So it looks like trouble's looking for us. You'll find what you're looking for. It was true in Paul's day. It's still true today. And so here the Apostle Paul, like a loving father or wise coach, he gave us the first key for winning the battle between our ears. Keep seeking the things above. Why? Why? Because we've been raised up with Christ. He brings in theology here. He wants us to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. The moment a person places their faith in Jesus Christ for the salvation of their souls... They are identified intimately, personally, with Jesus Christ. This means all the blessings of Jesus' death are immediately applied to their life, resulting in the total, complete forgiveness of their sin. Past, present, and future, they are declared righteous, justified in God's sight. That's why there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. Praise God for that one. But it doesn't stop there. All the benefits of Jesus' resurrection 
are applied to our life as well, resulting in the gift of eternal life. So many people wonder what it's going to be like after I die. What's going to happen? Will I go to heaven or not? For us Christians, the matter is solved. If you are in Christ, then you are guaranteed eternal life, a resurrected body. You will be with God forevermore. Praise God for that one. So, amen. All the benefits of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection belong to us. This is who we are. And the enemy wants to blind us confuse us, distract us. He wants us to be living in the filth and the mire in the ditch of this fallen world. And Paul's saying, get your eyes in the right place, my brothers and sisters. Keep seeking the things above because you have been raised up with Christ. It can be truly said for all who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ that Christ's death is our death, his life is our life. Therefore, since Jesus Christ has been raised up, we've been raised up too. It's a done deal. It's an accomplished fact. But where do you get that one from, Matthew? Notice that he uses past tense verbs. You have been raised up. It's already done. It's already accomplished. And this is not the first time he does that. He does the exact same thing in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. Notice this. Very famous first verse. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Look at this. To those who are called, past tense, according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, past tense, he also predestined, past tense, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, and whom he predestined, past tense, these he also called, past tense, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Now, I see all of the reasons why he would use past tense for called, predestined, for new, and justified. And then I get stuck with the word right there, glorified. Glorified. One question. Do any of us have resurrected bodies right now? Are any of us glorified right now? Nope. How do I know? Because I still am bald. (laughs) Oh, by the way, I'm going to have a full head of hair when I have a resurrected body, all of you will be bald when you have your resurrected bodies. Just just want you to know. (laughs) No, we haven't been glorified yet. But Paul speaks of it in the past tense because of who promised, who completed the work. It's true. It's a done deal. And oh, how our life would change if we could rise above by seeking the things above all that happens on this vertical plane or horizontal plane here and get our eyes where they belong. If only we could understand all that we have in Christ Jesus. We're not there yet, but it's a done deal. That's what Paul is saying. But in order for us to experience now Jesus Christ's victory over the battle between our ears, we must have undivided hearts. This is key. We must have undivided hearts. The command, keep seeking, is a divine command in the present tense, meaning it's to continually to be obeyed until we take our last breath. Every moment of every day, and let's be honest, It's a very real battle every day. Wouldn't you agree? There is a battle. It's not a one-time event. Oh, just when you think you're over that thought, there it comes again. It's an ongoing battle. And so Paul is saying that we need to continually strive when he says keep seeking. We need to seek earnestly. We need to fix our attention decisively toward our risen and ascended Savior now and always. Brothers and sisters, this is how Paul lived his life. You want to know what Paul did, 
how he was victorious in his thought life, this is what he did. Paul experienced Christ's victory over the battle between his ears because he knew who he is in Christ. And Paul kept seeking the things above because Paul had an undivided heart. He had a singular focus. And whenever that thought came in to try to drag him away, nope, I'm going to take that thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Oh, but you were a persecutor of the church. Nope, I'm not going to go there. It's all under the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to take that thought captive. I'm going to keep seeking the things above. I'm going to remember who I am in Christ. I'm going to have an undivided heart. Too many of us play in the weeds before we even realize we're in the weeds when it comes to our thought life. And then we begin to wonder, how in the world did I get here? One little thought leads to another thought, leads to another thought. One battle, defeat after defeat after defeat, and all of a sudden you feel defeated. That's the way it works, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, Paul gave us, I think, another inspiring glimpse into his heart when he shared with the Philippians how he applied this command to his personal journey of faith in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. He says, brethren, I do not regard myself as laying hold of it yet. See right there, it's an ongoing battle. I'm not there yet. But one thing, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul knew who he was. He was there when the first Christian was martyred and gave his hearty approval, the book of Acts says. That's why he said he was the least of the apostles, the least of the saints. Do you think the enemy ever beat him up over that one? You better believe it. Forgetting what lies behind, because I can't fix it. But Christ has fixed it for me. It's under the blood. Forgetting what lies behind, and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on. This is the one thing that he did for the goal, for the prize of the upward. Notice, upward call. Keep seeking the things above. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This can be true for us. If you are discouraged about your past, if the enemy and you're a believer in Jesus Christ keeps beating you up because of your past, that is a lie from the pit of hell. You are forgiven. God wants to make all things new. Forgetting what lies behind, press on. Keep seeking the things above. Win the battle between your ears. You see, Paul here is telling us that our lives must be governed by the pattern and the things of heaven which is precisely how Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Our Father, Jesus said, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, may your name be treated as holy in all that I do. That's what Jesus is saying there. Your kingdom come. How many of us are disturbed by what we see going on in our world right now? It breaks my heart to see the evil and the devastation because of sin. And I find myself throughout the day just broken hearted when I see all the devastation. I, I, I remember just this week, I was praying, I said, Lord, please make this stop. Please. And I felt like the Lord nudged me. I said, I need you to pray a different prayer. And the prayer is, your kingdom come. Because here's the truth, no 
human government is going to fix the problem in man's heart. It will only be fixed when Jesus Christ comes. Come, Lord Jesus, come. That's what we need to be praying for. Lord, we need your kingdom here on earth. Make it right, Lord. Make it right. And until that day, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is Paul saying here? What is Jesus saying here? They're saying if you want victory over the battle between your ears, then you and I need a new pursuit. We need God's will. We need to love what God loves, and we need to hate what God hates. We need to choose God's way over our own. We must seek God's counsel to direct our lives, and we need to pray for God's will to be done. That there's no difference between the execution of his will in heaven and the execution of his will here on earth in my life. Your kingdom come, your will be done here in my life the same way it's done in heaven. That's what we're praying for. Now, to have a new pursuit requires a new ambition. We need a new ambition. And what is that ambition? Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9. Therefore also we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. At home. Where's home? Heaven. That's what Paul's talking about. To be absent means to be here. Because our citizenship is in heaven. But whether we're at home with him or absent in here, either way, we want to be pleasing to him. And how can we be pleasing to him? We can only please him by walking by faith. And how do we walk by faith? By winning the battle between our ears. Because everything in this battle wants us to walk by sight and not by faith. Next we see We need to remember that we're seated with Christ. Third part of verse 1. And again, he's speaking of his position. You need to look at this and you think, well, it seems like he's repeating himself a lot here. Why would Paul repeat himself? Well, to emphasize a point. To help drive the point home. It's kind of like looking at a diamond. Here's a single diamond. And every time I turn it, I see a different facet which reflects in the light. I'm looking at the same diamond, but a different aspect of it, a different facet. And the same thing is true theologically here. Paul is looking at the same diamond, but from different angles to encourage and strengthen our faith in him. And he's letting us know we need to remember that we're seated with Christ. Where is Jesus Christ? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, a position of authority. And at Father God's right hand, Jesus Christ, he leads, he sanctifies, he empowers, he intercedes for his church. And every time I think about that, that Jesus is interceding, praying on our behalf, it blows me away. It's like drinking a 7-Eleven Slurpee, a big one on a hot summer day, real fast. You get that brain freeze. Every time I read that, and I think Jesus could be saying to the Father, help me by name, blows me away. Paul explains it more in Romans chapter 8, verses 33 and 34. He says, who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Why would Jesus intercede for us? Simply put, he knows our frame. He knows that we need comfort. He knows that we need guidance. He knows that we need protection. He knows that we can get easily distracted by temptations, the cares and worries of this world. And so he comes to our rescue and gives us the much needed grace. But here's something that's very important for us to see. In order to receive grace, you need to ask for grace. To receive it, you need to ask for it. James says you don't have because you don't ask. Well, is it because God doesn't want to give it to us? 
The writer of Hebrews answers that question in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. He says, since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Don't let anyone or anything take it away. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Here's the conclusion. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I look at those last few words there, to help in time of need. And I look at my life, perhaps you look at your life, and we think, when am I not in need of God's grace and mercy? I I always need God's grace and mercy. And it's a throne of grace, not a throne of judgment. And so the reality is, is God's saying, I want you to stay here at my throne of grace and always receive the mercy and the grace that you need. I will give it to you. We will never have to worry about God saying, you've been at the throne of grace a little too long. You've exceeded your quota for the day. No, he just keeps giving and giving and giving and giving again. And all we need to do is simply ask. You see, the truth is, we must be intentional about how we live each day of our lives. And I'm spending time on this idea of being seated with Christ because it's a glorious revelation. Think about this. In the heavenlies, we are seated with Christ. I'm not there, but I'm there because I'm in him and he's in me. And it must impact, therefore, how we stand here on earth as Christians. Why do so many Christians look like the rest of the world? Because we don't realize all that we have in Christ, seated with him. I'm reminded of a quote from a late senator, Hubert Humphrey, talking about politics. Yes, I'm bringing politics into it, just real briefly here. He said, you must remember that in politics, how you stand depends on where you sit. So how you stand as a politician depends on which political party you sit with. Well, one Christian commentator heard that quote from Hubert Humphrey, and he said in response, how I stand and walk depends on where I sit, and I am seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That's a biblical insight. That's theology applied to life. Now, in verses 2 through 3, Paul presses the point further and gave us the second key for victory over the battle between our ears. And again, it's going to sound similar, but it's different. But he's reinforcing a theological principle here. Number two, keep setting your mind on the things above. Keep seeking the things above. Keep setting your mind on the things above. But there's a difference. To set is another present tense command which means it's ongoing. Every moment of every day, this should be the focus of our lives. It means that we're so heavenly minded that we are earthly good. That's the idea here. To set means to concentrate your mind on that which is eternal, not temporal. So I'm setting my mind on the things above, those things that are eternal, not temporal. What are temporal things? They are transitory things. There are things that are vulnerable to change and become obsolete, which in many ways I think sums up life. For instance, I remember the day my dad brought us home the very first video game. Back in the day, does anyone remember Pong? That was a rocking game. (laughs) You know, you got the paddles. Right? You got the one little line, that's one. You got the other one right here. And you got this square that's supposed to be a ball. And you just go back and forth and back and forth. And as kids were going, this is so cool, Dad. This is like the best game ever. And kids today would look at that and say, what in the world is that? Look at the graphics on this thing. I could even put English on the ball when I hit it just right. It kind of spins. They're going, yeah, really? Nice, yeah, cool, obsolete. 
It also reminds me of my daughter's first pediatric visit, Melina. Have you noticed that medical opinions and recommendations change a lot? Anyone else? Especially recently? Well, we noticed that when our daughter had her first pediatric visit. Her closest sibling in age is seven years older. Heidi and I have a lot of older children. And so we go into the doctor's visit, and we've been hearing from the nurses all the things that we did before with our other kids we're not supposed to do now because it's all wrong. Every one of it, it's all wrong. Don't do it anymore. So we're sitting there with the doctor, and the doctor says, you guys are pros. I don't need to tell you anything. And so Heidi, what does she say? She goes, uh, excuse me, can we have an updated owner's manual, please? <laughs> Paul explains why in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, he says, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, we look at the things that are here and think that's where life is, but it's temporal. It's gonna fade away. But the things that we don't see now, they're eternal, and they'll never tarnish. Moths, rust can never destroy them they remain. And so Paul repeats himself, but then he adds a contrast between the things in heaven versus the things on earth because Paul knows human nature. And what does he know about human nature? Your heart will follow your treasure. It always does. Your heart will follow your treasure. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. We all know it. We concentrate, and we concentrate really well on what we love. And Paul is saying, if you concentrate on what's eternal, then you're focusing on what really satisfies and is certain. It'll never become obsolete. But if we concentrate on what's temporal, then we'll be focusing on what is ultimately unfulfilling and uncertain. And Paul got this. And that's why in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, he's looking at life and all that life offers, and he compares it to all that God offers through Christ Jesus. And he comes to this conclusion. I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. The world wraps it up, puts a pretty bow on it, makes you think this is where it's at. And Paul says, rubbish. I found something far better. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's where I want to be. You see, what we value, what we treasure will reveal what we set our minds on. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Now notice the first part of verse three. Paul says, for you have died. For you have died. And here's another important point I want to capture. What Paul is saying is we have died with Christ to earthly things. But it begs the question, what does it mean to say that we've died with Christ? I'm still alive. How have I died with Christ? That doesn't make sense. Well, let's back up and take a running start at it, okay? Jesus Christ died for us, as we've talked about before, as our substitute. But Jesus Christ not only died for our sins to pay for sin's penalty, Jesus also died unto sin, and broke sin's power over us. He paid the penalty for our sin. He also broke the power of sin over us. Someday when Christ returns, he's going to deliver us from the presence of sin. But he's delivered us from the penalty, and he's broken the power. So when Paul says that we've died with Christ, again, he's speaking of our identification with Christ. Christ died and sin could not tempt him, master him, okay? Now we're in Christ, and as a result, we've died with Christ, and sin no longer is to be master over us. And that's why Paul says in Romans 6, verse 2 and 11, how shall we who died to sin still live in it? If you're a Christian, you can't live in sin, 
The Holy Spirit ruins sin for you because he convicts you. Even so, he says, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You died to that, but now you're alive to Christ. We can say no to sin. We need to have an answer when temptation comes knocking. No. Just say no. And now through Christ, we can It reminds me of this funny story about these two sisters. They were party animals. If there was a party in their area, they were going to be there every time. And then God got a hold of their heart. They become born-again Christians. And guess what the enemy does? Does what he always does. He tries to bring you back into the partying. So they get an invitation to a party. And I love their response. This is their RSVP to the party. We regret, and I quote, that we cannot attend because we recently died. (laughs) There's some good theology there. We would look at temptation completely different if we realize we've died to those things. Amen? So again, Paul is speaking of the victory that we have through our faith in and identification with Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, we can now say no to sin and be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Next, we see in verse 3 that our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Again, I want to unpackage that. What does it mean to be hidden with Christ in God? It means that we're secure not vulnerable. He's protecting us. We're under the shadow of his wing. I know so many people today, Christians feel vulnerable. We feel exposed, but you're not. You're hidden in Christ. You're protected. You're not vulnerable. You're not exposed. This is a time where the world needs us to rise up and boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. It's time for the church to say, with Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Amen? This is the time. We need to be praying for the church to be revived and for there to be a great awakening for the world to see their need for a Savior. This idea of being secure is captured in the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verses 27 through 30, when Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I love that picture. We're in Christ, hidden in Christ, in his hand. No one can snatch us away. He's the good shepherd. And then you have the Father. It's this idea of double protection, double security. No one can snatch us away from the Father or the Son. Now, what's interesting in the Bible is this. Whenever you see this idea of something being hidden in the Bible, it means that eventually it's going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed. Right now it's concealed, but someday it's going to be revealed. So what Paul is saying is what's been been hidden will one day be revealed. And this is important. Meaning, all will one day know what you and I know, that we belong to the Lord. I think the world looks at us and say, you guys, you Christians, you're kooky dukes. You're crazy. There's no God, or if there is a God, you got the wrong one. But someday, the truth will be revealed at the second coming of Jesus Christ, and then they'll realize, oh, there is a God. That's the right one. And they're with him. <laughs> That's what John says in 1 John 3, 2 through 4. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we shall be. We know when he appears, we shall be like him. Hidden, now revealed. 
because we shall see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. The point, as Christians, we're both dead and alive. Dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Dead to the world, but alive in Christ. And that's why Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Again, insight into the battle between Paul's ears. How does he overcome it? I've been crucified with Christ. Well, when was Paul crucified with Christ? The moment he placed his faith in Jesus Christ. His death became his death, and Christ's life became Paul's life, and the same thing is true for us. And now we walk by faith. The last key is found in verse 4. When the battle between our ears is overwhelming, we must remember this very important point. Christ is our life. Too many people are looking for life in all the wrong places. Christ is our life. In fact, Christ is life. In him, we live and breathe and have our being, physically speaking. But spiritually speaking, being born again, we come alive when we receive Jesus as our Savior. Jesus is the way to life. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And as I've said earlier, Jesus is the giver of eternal life. 1 John 5, 11 through 12, and the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. And our Savior is the one who changes lives. Just look at Peter, the man with the foot-shaped mouth, Denied the Lord three times. Then he sees the resurrected Lord. Filled with the Holy Spirit. And thousands come to faith in Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost. We've been talking about the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus. Persecutor of the church. Confronted on the Damascus Road. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Jesus, whom you persecute. Transformed the writer of most of the New Testament, the one who says, you know what? When I look at the world and all it has to offer and Christ, I take Christ. Change lives. As I close, the last thing we see here in verse four is that we need to bring Christ glory until Jesus returns. Jesus Christ is coming back. I've read the end of the book. God wins. Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's going to make it all right, my friends. He's going to settle all accounts. May we be ready. May we not be ashamed at his appearing. But like John say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Peter, again, like Paul, tells us, how to win this battle between our ears in 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16. Very similar to Paul. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts, which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who has called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. As I close, how is it going? How is the battle between your ears? Do you find yourself with a divided heart or an undivided heart? Are you pursuing temporal treasures or eternal treasure? Where are you looking for life? Is it in all the wrong places or in Christ? I want to encourage you to make Psalm 19, verse 14, your prayer as I am. The psalmist writes, 
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Father, that's our heart this morning. We want victory. And we thank you that the victory is ours. And so now we want to apply that victory to our lives. Help us with the battle between our ears, Lord. Some of us have been lied to. We've listened to lies. We've told lies. We want to see clearly who you are, what our Savior has done, and who we are in you. Help us win this battle between our ears. If that's you, would you just raise your hand and tell that to the Lord? Lord, I want your victory. Please help me with the battle between my ears. Just raise your hand. Lord, help me. Give me victory. Help me to remember all that I am in you. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here and online. Bless them. Strengthen them. Help us walk in the victory that is ours in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of my brothers and sisters in Christ said, amen. amen. Can we give thanks to our Lord? Amen. Amen.